Hello everyone. Um, welcome back to a new episode on the podcast. Uh, today I'm joined Sam, and Sam's going to share um, her her IBD journey. Um, and it's going to be really good fun because um, I think we we've talked about this since late last year. I think um, we have, and we uh, originally we we was actually going to wait until the end of the year. I think this year, but um, we we decided or uh, do it sooner. Why not? Um, but yeah, it, it's going to be really fun. Sam's going to share her journey with with IBD Crohn's, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about gaming because we both like gaming. Um, and uh, before we even start, we I think we spent like a good thirty minutes or about thirty minutes even just talking about it, t- talking about it, and yeah. But Sam, uh, if you mind, just do a little introduction of yourself. Um, I always say when I introduce a guest. I feel like I've done it already, but if there's anything else you want to say that I haven't said already, go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. It always puts you on the spot, don't it? When you fit it, like someone says, oh, introduce yourself, tell us a fun fact about yourself, and then you realise there's actually nothing fun about you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, so obviously I'm Sam. I do, I do like to do a bit of gaming. Um, my IBD journey is a little bit probably complicated, but yeah, so we can get into that in a minute. But yeah, hi, everyone. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you say I think when we when we first spoke, you said that as well. That is it is a bit complicated. Um, how how would you kind of can you explain why 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 is it quite complicated? Yeah. So, um, basically, it is a bit of background. When I was, uh, three, I think three three days after my twenty second, I was uh, actually r- rushed into hospital. I'd been diagnosed at like the age of thirteen with panic attacks, um, and then cut a long story short, at twenty one, twenty two, when I was rushed into hospital, it actually turned out I'd got a heart defect. I've got uh, something called Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, and up until then, life had been pretty good to be honest like my 21st year was probably one of my favorite years I'd ever had I've gone doing a bit of traveling everything like that um literally had my birthday and then I think it was three days after my uh I think it was three days after my 22nd birthday yeah basically I was I was rushed into hospital um I did end up having surgery for it uh, that night I could go into quite a bit of detail about it but it was quite a horrific quite scary time I didn't know if I was going to come out um and yeah I had surgery in the June the following year and, and touch wood um pretty much they scarred some of my heart I had like an extra muscle they they burnt it I've just got scar tissue in my heart now and pretty much was fighting um took a business on pretty much just shortly after it and yeah I was just thinking right let, let's just get back on track after having a few years of being ill uh, well not a few years of being ill it was just like a, probably nine months something like that um and then probably about six months after this I started getting stomach issues and uh it sort of was one of those things where like most people I feel like you're either quite severe and you get diagnosed pretty quick and life gets pretty dark pretty fast and you have being told about all these things like having stomas and stuff like that uh, or you're the opposite where you're probably more of a mild case and you spend basically like the next five years of your life trying to fight to figure out actually what's going wrong um, which for me was obviously that one where I had quite a few years of issues where I'd go to the doctors they tell me it was IBS um, I think they did um, a stool sample and stuff like that and then they obviously just said oh it's IBS I had all the usual things that I think a lot of people probably tell you where they had like the peppermint capsules I even got told to go on antidepressants because that would probably help my stomach like you name it they just kept telling me it was IBS and like keep the food diary do this um and obviously you get to a point where you think well why am I going because obviously I'm getting nowhere they clearly think it's in my head I do have a history of anxiety I've got an anxiety disorder so the minute I think they probably see anxiety on your records probably think oh she's an anxious person she's probably causing her IBS herself blah 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 um obviously keep a food diary which is what I did and then it got to a point where you just like every single food that I'm eating pretty much is making me ill therefore let's just not eat those foods so every time a food made me bad I just cut it out cold turkey 
and it got to a point where I think I was eating probably like not even 500 calories a day and I could still be quite ill on it um and yeah I'd, I'd know at times I'd have like a 12 hour 13 hour working day where I'd probably not have eaten all that working shift in fear I'd be ill I'd go home and then I'd probably eat a croissant or two go to bed and that'd be me done so like I say I probably burnt 2,000 3,000 calories that day and I'd probably only eaten 400 of them and half the time I'd still be going to the toilet excessively even though I'm not really eating anything um so obviously as you can imagine the weight's dropping off me I'd had periods of time where it was obviously a lot worse than others so I had when my granddad uh, was on his deathbed bless him obviously that was quite a traumatic time I think I lost about a stone and a half during that time period and then I had another occasion where I, I can't remember what triggered it it was just a random case where I was really ill for another two three weeks and I lost another stone and a half and then obviously in between that I was just not really um um, and it got to a point where I'd keep like lemon sherbets in my car or fizzy drinks. And if I felt like I was going to pass out, I'd just have something dead sugary and just think, please don't pass out. Just have something sugary, carry on. Um, and eventually, later on, I did find out apparently I should have been collapsing most days from lack of eating and nutrition. And the only thing that apparently was stopping it from happening um is because of carb loading which I don't go to the gym but apparently um the foods I was choosing to eat were always dry carbs so like bread dry potato crisps they were all my safe food um so yeah so they were the only thing really keeping me going um I think I'd go to the toilet up to 14 times a day even just drink if I drank a glass of water the water would without being vulgar come straight back out looking like water it, um I think I could eat something and within 15 minutes being bad um and then eventually the one day because I had quite a few issues with family at that point where they all just thought I'll oh, just was I don't know maybe suffering from a bit of anorexia or something like that um because I'd been in a long-term relationship I'd come out of and I think maybe people sometimes assume being a woman or you're trying to make yourself look better by being skinny uh, so I had to deal with quite a lot of stuff uh, and backlash from friends and family doing it out of worry but obviously at times could force me to eat things that would then just make me ill again um, and then one day I thought I had a chest infection so um my mom went mad and was like you have to go to the doctor something's really wrong you know something's wrong you're avoiding going please go to the doctors and um basically get them to just check I think you've got a chest infection and at this point I'd been having blood in my nose um for like a fortnight every morning when I woke up as well so when I went, they were like, good news is you don't have a chest infection. However, you're not going anywhere because the last time we weighed you, yeah, I think I was like nine stone. And at this point, I was about seven stone eight. And apparently, um, I'd been, it had been dropping off me for a while. So I think when I was bad with my heart, I did pull the weight on for a bit. So I think my heaviest, I think I got to was 11, six, six. But I've always sort of sat around the 10 stone mark give or take depending on how good I'm being so obviously to be seven stone eight was quite bad um and they were obviously very concerned about the blood in my nose and the weight loss so effectively they hinted to me initially about anorexia and then they also hinted to me I realized later leukemia because I was covered in bruises um and obviously I was waking up with blood in my nose and they kept asking me do you cough off with blood I'm like no it's just coming out my nose. it's only first thing it's not a lot it's it's fine um which years later I did find out the reason for that but at the time they just thought it was a bit of sinuses um so yeah so they obviously triggered to get a, a stool sample done which showed slight inflammation not a lot uh, and then from there it escalated so eventually get to the hospital uh, I've since had two colonoscopies which has been fun I've also had a pill cam um, and eventually after like a significant period of time because Covid interfered so it took quite a while to get 
anywhere with those tests. They eventually diagnosed me as Crohn's and said I had one small ulcer where you large and small me. I can never pronounce it. It's like the most common type of Crohn's. Um, and I had up to, I think they said up to 20 ulcers in my small intestine, which was probably what was causing a lot of the pain. Because obviously I imagine most people, if they're watching, who have Crohn's, do not need me to describe how the symptoms feel. Um, so, yeah, so basically I got diagnosed as Crohn's um, and they said it's a very mild form of Crohn's, sort of very lucky. But then they told me I couldn't have treatment because I've never had EBV. So they said that they couldn't give me meds and I wasn't sick enough for biologics. So I had about eight weeks worth of steroids and I wasn't tapered off. So I ended up with quite a few issues because of that. And I don't think they realised what they'd done. Um, and then basically a year later, they told me, no, actually, we don't think you have Crohn's. Any, we don't think you've got it. So and then I was like, well, if I don't have Crohn's, what have I got? And then I was like, oh, we don't know. It could just be build up of bacteria. Um, only time will tell. I'm like, thanks. That, that's really helpful. Um, so I've got a history of three family members who've all got Crohn's um given a lot of the symptoms I have and the fact I had ulceration and stuff it, it it's it's highly likely I do have a mild form of Crohn's but obviously I've had that diagnosis technically took away from me um probably about six months ago and touch wood I've been doing quite well I've been managing to introduce a few more foods into my diet and stuff so for now I really just had too many years now of it's been an eight, nine year battle now and I'm just tired and I'm doing all right. So I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to leave that alone for a while and just pray that it doesn't come back. So the answer is I just don't know. Some of my symptoms I have are a bit more, um, I don't know how much information you want, but I probably would still indicate more Crohn's over IBS. Um, so, yeah, so that's pretty much where I'm at with that. And during the time and the battle of that, I also got ended up getting diagnosed with a rare blood disorder. So that's what happened with the nose. Um, and also during that time, I also had problems with rib damage. Um, and I've got costochondritis and slit ribs, which is one of those things that it, no one actually really knows what causes it. It's, it is chronic. It's never going to go. The treatments I had for it failed. Uh, so at one point I was pretty miserable because I had all these different symptoms going on and no real answers. And then now I've sort of got some answers, but not full answers. Um, so, yeah, so it is a complicated one. Um, I can compare notes with obviously people who um, may obviously have mild symptoms. I can't imagine what people with moderate to severe go through because... I spoke to people myself firsthand and I just think I don't think enough credit is given to people with Crohn's or with colitis or any kind of bowel issue because a lot of the time in the politest way possible to doctors their attitude will be but you're not dying as in right this second but it's almost like slow torture and a slow death and it's life limiting so if you're having a bad day, you're now thinking about can you leave the house? Like I don't think enough credit is given to people who do go through these issues. And as someone who doesn't really know what's wrong with me, and at the minute I'm having a good ride, I still have days where things do go backwards. Um, but yeah, so like I say, it's a complicated one. So I wouldn't like to say yes, 100% I do have Crohn's. My answer is I just... Uh, I don't know I've had I've suffered from ulcers so I do have some understanding but I wouldn't ever want to fully compare myself so I think it's disrespectful to anyone who is suffering quite severely from it as well um but yeah so like I say I definitely have stomach issues just don't know what they are yeah it must, yeah. Be, a pain. It must be um quite annoying that yeah 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 it, it's been 
like I say, it's been a frustrating battle and now I'm just at acceptance. Like, this is my life now. I will have times where um, I do have days where I can't really get away from the loo. Like, there's a few weeks ago where I've, I've had to almost adapt my life to it now. So I, I was by 17 years a hairdresser and having stomach issues and a rib condition it's just you can't do standing on your feet all day with bad posture especially on days when obviously you almost can't eat whilst you've got clients in just in case you need to be ill so I've adapted a lot of stuff Uh, roughly a year they're they're absolutely lovely they know about my health issues and stuff and unfortunately I did have a day where I was just ill and I was fighting I woke up and you know it's like I feel a bit iffy but I think I'm all right uh drove to the office um and was like yeah I think I'm all right I think it was like 11 o'clock here and then you know it's like oh, I'm not fighting and I spent a bit of the afternoon in the toilet and it's mortifying because you're at work and I hope people don't think I'm going for a skive on my phone in the toilet but it just literally unfortunately and then they're like oh if you want you can go home and it's like well in the politest way possible it's an errand and a bit drive home so I'm stuck here because there's no way I'm risking having a flare up just to drive in my car that I'm probably going to get stuck in traffic. So I was like, I'm basically stuck here for a while, don't worry. Hopefully it'll eventually. But but yeah, so I don't, don't think people realise like little things like that as well, that once a flare up starts, you're sort of a bit bound to wherever it is you are at that moment as well. So Yeah. Flare ups are so bad, and the the pain they cause they is it, it, it's hard to explain because it's hard because if you haven't experienced that pain, you you're not gonna think anything of it. But like us, like experiencing it, I tend to when I'm in a flare up because every flare up is different. Like not you're not always gonna get painful ones. You might just get ones where your levels are really out of range. Um, but when I was in pain. Like um when I was diagnosed with him before, I, I was having a burning sensation. It kind of felt like um it's almost like your your insides are on fire. And then what I would do, it, it won't make any difference at all. But I would hold my stomach and squeeze it like the outside to try and it's it not helping one bit. Um, but <laughs> I was, was going to say, so it's like you're making it more painful. Yeah, than anything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I was I, I would hold it and. Mm. at the time I was at school so I would hold it and then teachers just say you do you need to go to doctors or do you need to go to a nurse downstairs um and it's hard because it, it takes so much energy out of you to reply to people and to keep your um I guess to keep your strength up um because you don't want other people to see you differently well this is the thing is I feel like working from home a lot of the time if you're not well no one else is seeing it and I think a big issue is you worry about like in a workplace or your friends you don't want to be seen as not being as capable of as others in fact I read a study a while back that says most people with chronic health conditions or disabilities usually have far less unarranged time off than anyone else whereas without sounding rude a healthy person might think oh I don't feel like working today it's fine Whereas for someone who's got a few health issues might think, oh, I, but I don't want them to think I'm not capable. I don't want them to think I'm sky. But it's almost like you've got something to prove. So a lot of the time you'll work in a situation where you, you really should be in bed, yet you'll keep working. And you almost at times are expected to keep going like friend, friends, family. They don't always understand that. Like for me personally, when I first start going to the toilet, I probably my energy is probably not too bad but obviously the longer it goes on for the tighter and tighter you get and if you get lucky and it's just for that day or for half a day it's probably not too bad you can just go and rest it off but at times it can go on for days weeks 
and you're just getting more and more tired and it's okay going oh I need a day off or whatever from seeing friends doing this doing the other but obviously you can't spend a fortnight four weeks just recovering from time and you almost constantly plan your entire life around how tired you're actually going to be and it almost makes you exhausted just trying to plan your entire life around like your capabilities of what you can and can't do and explaining to people what you can and can't eat uh, like with my rib there's obviously limitations on certain things I can and can't do so trying to explain to people what I can and can't do and then people are, are, arrange activities where I don't know I've got to hit a baseball bat or something and they're like oh but it's just a simple activity and it's like it might be for you but I've actually lost some of the use um so on my left side for instance at times it'll lock up a bit I don't actually notice usually it's locked up until I try to go to do certain things and then I'm like oh it's not fully working that side a little bit now so like simple things like doing that and swinging a bat like properly if that's on a day it's locked up I can't do that anymore and I think a lot of the time being younger people just assume that you like I, I don't know how they expect us to look should we be in a wheelchair for you to accept we're sick or so managing tiredness and people's expectations of you become very, very difficult very quickly I think a lot of the time as well and people can say silly things like oh I could do a case of Crohn's so I could lose some weight and just really rude things at times really that they don't realize just how offensive it actually is to be honest yeah definitely like, like like you say um like if you've lost a lot of weight because of Crohn's like you you hear people say like you look good and and that they'll say they won't think that it's offensive they'll think that, that, that that's something that's good but that that's one of the most common things I think that that people do say because yeah it's good to lose weight but it's not good to make you ill while in that, doing that no so I had the initial you look good you're starting to lose weight and then eventually you'd get because obviously being in hairdressing you have a lot of clients come in and they're probably not aware of your struggles obviously I try and hide them um and then you'll get the oh I don't think you should lose any more weight you're starting to look a bit sick and then you get comments like you don't look good today you've gone too thin um I do think skinny shaming at times can actually be a, like very it can happen quite a bit I've even seen it happen to other friends who who've got health issues and it's like it's really frustrating because at the time people were saying stuff like that to me I'd actually uh, paid for a private dietitian and I was actually taking weight gain drinks at the time um so on days when I couldn't eat a lot I'd eat like a bit of dry carbs and I got these weight gain drinks so to have people almost going oh you look disgusting because your bone, bones like protruding and stuff and it's like you should try and gain some weight and it's like really I've I've not I've not thought about that that that's a revelation that is <laughs> thanks <laughs> so um I mean I have at, at the minute I'm actually I probably could do losing some to be fair but I have gained quite a bit at the minute because things are doing well I'm doing a sit down job I've started to gain a bit of weight now but then part of me is like you know what it's almost actually a luxury in a way to be able to say at the minute I'm healthy enough to have gained weight because there'd be plenty of people out there who desperately like I was trying to put some weight back on um so yeah so I think when you are having a period where things are working out a bit more health wise I do wake up a lot of the days and just be grateful that currently because you don't you just don't know is it going to last like if it is Crohn's it probably isn't going to last like so you have to be really grateful for the days that you do have where you wake up you're not in pain like my ribs okay my stomach's okay my my stomach's not burning I've managed to eat a food that I've literally not run to the toilet so you have to really appreciate the days I think that you do get that are good and really make a conscious effort to go actually you know what today was good on the base I didn't spend it glued to a toilet for a start yeah. so yeah they are the good days when you even it may not not much to someone else, but it is much to you because it, it's good if you're like if you're pain free for a day or on stuff like that. And 
I it, it, it's weird because you could be it could be a day is good for 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 someone, but for someone else it could be a few days. So it is nice. I think it's always nice to when we're not in any pain to kind of I know just do something fun, do do something fun we haven't done in ages because when we're in pain we're when we're in pain, we're we're stuck at home and we can't we can't do much. We go to the hospital and waiting hours on end to try and get to that appointment, and it's it's annoying sometimes. Um, like the waiting game of it all. Yeah, I think that's the thing. Is like people will often say, "Oh, have you thought about going to the doctors?" Or like, do you know something where you? Like in the politest way possible, like you need a specialist, you're probably waiting on an appointment. There's plenty of other people waiting on an appointment, and also there's just not enough research on the illness either. So I think people think you can take a magic tablet and everything's going to be fine again. And it's weird because with my heart, I was put in a life threatening situation. Granted, I was on a waiting list as an emergency, it took a long period of time. I had the heart surgery done. It was catheter ablation. Like the technology on it's incredible. And other than the occasional flutter, I'm basically pretty much as good as cured from it. And that's obviously heart surgery. And I'm very grateful to the people that did it because obviously something that impacted me a, 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 like an all right amount, nothing major yet. People with their stomachs, it doesn't matter. Even if you've had a bag, there's still going to be obviously complications and you're never going to be right. And there's just not enough research there. So it's almost like, yeah, it's a total different kettle of fish. Like if someone said you had to go through your heart and your heart operation again, even though I was in a life-threatening situation, would you do it? You'd still probably actually pick that over having a life-limiting lifelong in chronic condition that there's not enough research even if you take biologics meds it's all slowly killing you it's not it's not a good place to be in for, for a lot of people and quite a few people have said if they're on meds like sam don't forget the side effects of those as well so you think by taking this medication it's gonna make your stomach better and actually you're probably gonna have like your face but like a balloon different thing so I don't think there's any real clear way of fully treat, like even just treating it, let alone curing it. Yeah, that that that, that is really tough, and I think like the whole getting seen, like you say, that doing definitely uh, like a go to person to go to because like whenever we are something's happened with our Crohn's or we think something's up, um, well when something's up, we we get told to to go and get an appointment at your local surgery, doctor surgery, who will then refer you to the hospital, um, really. So really to, that's a waste of time, really, because they can't do anything because they're not specialised in IBD. So I think that's annoying when you go there and they say, I can't do anything to help you, you have to go to the hospital. That's the annoying thing. And then they'll, you'll go there and it, it, it may be annoying because it, if if it is something serious with your IBD or your Crohn's or something that's going on, it could make it worse by just wasting your time to go to the surgery. It is quite a scary thought, to be honest, and not just that. It's like little things as well. So, like, um, it sounds bad, but my blood disorder um, is roughly for every person out there with Crohn's and colitis, there's only one person roughly, maybe two, with this blood disorder. So the minute you say to people the blood disorder, all your doctors are straight on Google because it, if you're lucky, they've heard of it, but they'll always go, oh, but I don't actually know, I don't know a patient with it. Um, when they told me they were testing for it, I asked one of the clients who actually works at one of the local hospitals, who's the one that usually administers, obviously, like biologics and um like um takes blood tests and stuff with people usually like Crohn and stuff like that and um I said to her oh by the way have you ever actually tested for um so I've got inherited factor seven um and she was, I was like have you ever tested for this like fa factor seven and she was like you know what well, obviously we trained to do it but I've never even had to do a test for it 
let alone know anyone with it. Um, so obviously, with my blood disorder, I'm categorised as like mild. Obviously, I was lucky. I was diagnosed where I wasn't in a life and death situation where I'm bleeding out, and then they've realised it's gushing out of me. I was very lucky that it almost it raised questions from my stomach that ended up with me in the blood department. And I remember at the time, thinking, God, I'm just adamant on going through how many different departments because I've got like rheumatology with my rib, obviously gastro with um, my stomach. I'd previously been through heart and lung. And then obviously, um, I mean, they'd even sent me through gyno as well for my blood before I ended up at hematology. So I was like, I'm just collecting all these badges almost at this point with these hospital departments um yeah and it's like yeah so that at that point you just like oh like what else because yeah when they said oh by the at first I was just like oh it's probably going to be lack of iron vitamin k I don't eat properly I struggle to whole food went for the consultation on that one and I even said to the guy look I'm going to be honest I think I've wasted your time I can't hold food I, I, I just genuinely think I, I think it I'd had a iron of six I think for over a year and um I struggle with iron tablets they make my stomach a lot more painful a lot worse um and uh they just kept saying oh you're not sick enough for IV and frankly hematology did step in and say actually she is sick enough for IV so we're going to give it a and initially they give me iron and I tried vitamin K sort of stuff and it hadn't worked and then eventually they ran me and was just like oh did you take the iron we give you? And I was like, yeah. And I was like, the irony is I, I, I cut myself on the glass vial on the last dose and I just bled out everywhere. And I remember thinking, well, that hasn't worked. And then I was like, oh, on your records, it doesn't even show that it almost doesn't even look like you drank it. And I was like, well, I did. It was vile. It's the only thing I've drank that is worse than bell prep, by the way. It was horrific. Oh, um, so, <laughs> yeah, it was actually worse than prep. <laughs> I think I'd rather have drank prep, so you can imagine just how bad it was because prep prep's horrific. Um, so yeah, um, they were like, by the way, we I know you fed up a bit in pokes and prodded in departments, but we think you might actually have a blood disorder. So unfortunately, we're gonna have to poke and prod you some more, and I, obviously I, I did. So it's like even when you go to the doctors, like they might they might well obviously they probably know Crohn's and stuff, but some of the health issues like even my heart because I have to write that on forms because obviously any form you get have you had heart surgery yes I have what's it for put it down it's wall Parkinson white they're like what's that go and google it and I'm like this does not fill me with confidence I know obviously doctors can't remember everything I get that and obviously my blood disorder is quite rare um but it's still the more common of the rare ones in the factors as far as I'm aware but Wolf Parkinson White is actually a really common heart condition to actually have. Um, so when they're Googling that, I'm like, this is a bit worrying. So you can't, I don't think healthy people always realise that actually doctors only know uh, there's a reason why you have GPs and consultants and, and specialists. They obviously will have, GPs will have obviously a, a sort of like a rounded knowledge of a lot of things but it's probably limited whereas a co consultant's like my consultant for my blood for instance and he's like really good like he knows everything but I don't think people understand it until they've been through it really definitely and even in, like I was speaking about like the rare blood 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 disorder you have um even consultants I don't think will know unless they've diagnosed you so um yeah. like I, I have a rare thing too i have a rare chromosome so i i'm missing um an iq and okay. um yeah and i'll and i'll say and i'll go to like when i told my well i, I did my mum did because my mum knows that as a name it's a long name like, but like okay. the, the, the actual like the chromosome is like IPIQ six seven eight nine so all, all these different numbers and letters that I can't mm. remember for the life of me. But my mum actually was there, and she she says um, to the consultant, do, 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 "Do you know what this um rare, rare, rare chromosome is?" Um, and I think the the matter of the conversation was, 
that we were saying about rare things can happen. It's not impossible. Um, because I think at the time we were talking about um, like my hair because I, 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 over the years I've had Crohn's and I've been on the immunosuppressants medication I'm on. Um, I've lost hair, quite a lot of hair um, because yeah. I, I, I had loads of hair before um, and I was when I brush my hair in the morning I always do it a certain way just to mm. try and hide it a little bit um, and then that they say I went to another um, meeting about it and then they, they say it's not it's, it's naturally it's it's um it's not because of the crimes of someone else so that's why we brought this into it because because they said it's rare it's rare anyone loses it for for crones and i we, we put this rare chromosome into it because we say it's rare things can things happen that they're rare it doesn't mean they're impossible yeah see we've we've had uh, i sort of disagree with doctors because a lot of the time they'll say about not losing hair and stuff pretty much everyone i've spoken to with crohn's and i can even say firsthand yeah. at times yeah. i'd literally do that through my hair and it'd all just be on my hat especially on the front i was starting to get ball patches and obviously for some people i imagine it's probably side effects of meds but also if you can't eat a nutritious meal because um I know for most people with Crohn's, you can't eat like salads and healthy stuff generally you struggle with because that's what makes me think mine probably is Crohn's because I could actually go out and eat a curry and probably be fine. But if I try and eat a Sunday dinner with like healthy vegetable on, guarantee I'll be in that toilet in oh my stomach will be in agony. Mm. Um, and things like potatoes, if I have a jacket potato, which I love, I like to eat the skins. If I eat the skins, I'll be in pain. Like it's just, it's a, it's almost like I know that if I have a jacket potato, it's like, what are you doing later? Are you willing to take the pain? Because that's basically going to happen. Um. So if you're not he eating the correct food, you're not giving your body the right nutrition. It's going to prioritize your organs over anything else. Your hair is going to be one of the last things it prioritizes. So if you're not feeding your hair correctly, of course, it's going to start to fall out. And also, um, dry skin. I don't know about you, but I know quite a few of the people I spoke to all complain our skin's like bone dry. And the minute you go on like steroids or anything like that, my, my face they give me. Oh, I can never pronounce it. It's the, one of the newer ones, but but something like that. Um, I was only on it for a short period on a low dose, and instantly my my skin was like sandpaper. I got all rashes. I started to get like the little hamster cheeks and stuff. Um, and then yeah, and then when I come off, I'm like, I developed quite a lot of rashes. Um, so I don't think they always appreciate the side effects of these meds and the fact that actually if you're not getting the right nutrition of course your skin and your hair is not going to be good because it's your body's going to be more concerned about pumping your blood through your veins really isn't it than your hair unfortunately that's it yeah there's so many ways that it can happen like just uh, like i can't for me I, I i can't eat um i can eat fruit and everything um but when when I was I lost loads of weight when I was getting diagnosed or the year I was I was, I was getting diagnosed in October of um twenty seventeen um so I, I I could eat chicken that's all I could eat really I couldn't eat anything at one point I had to put put on the liquid drinks couldn't eat. I couldn't have them because I didn't like them um yeah. and I was empty so when I had my colonoscopy that I got diagnosed with I was empty anyway so I didn't go to the toilet at all when, yeah. when I was having the prep. So I kind of thought that was a waste of time, <laughs> but they wanted to make sure they wanted to make sure that I was all empty. You know, you know, you know what they're like. Uh, so, um, and I literally thought there was something wrong. There's something wrong because I'm not going to the toilet. Like, and it's because I'm empty because I haven't eaten anything. I, I, I'm not eating. Um, so I, I have all that, but now I can eat near enough anything, but 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 I can't have a, a spicy food really. Um, yeah. I loved them beforehand. I, I, I love spice food. Um, like whenever I got a kebab every once in a while, put the chili sauce all over it. I would, <laughs> and, and I'd like to. I was, I'll have. I would have enjoyment of having a drink every five seconds, um, and then having a burning toilet in the morning. Um, but um, but another thing I can't have is caffeine. So I can't have caffeine. So 
um, yeah. I'll just have decaf. Um, yeah. Really, at the moment, they 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 are the only two. Uh, but the, the annoying thing about decaf, so it, it it's very limited, like the restaurants and, and and places you go that have decaf. Like Costa and yeah. Starbucks now do have decaf, so they they actually do. Um, and and places like if you go to McDonald's, they won't. They that they won't. Yeah. So it's very. It, it's not often that you'll find places that have decaf and, and things that support people with like IBD or chronic illness. The other one I found was like, cause I'm actually egg intolerant these days. So um, I was having severe acid reflux and it took me about two years to finally realize after having a food diary, what do all these foods have in common? And obviously the answer was egg cause it's in pretty much everything. Mm. So anyway, you go, like if I was to make a cheesecake at home from scratch, I would not put egg in a cheesecake. The minute you buy pre-made cheesecake in um like Asda or wherever, it always has egg in. Same as apple pie, I wouldn't make apple pie with egg in. But the minute you go and buy a shop bought apple pie, it's got egg in. So you pretty much have to assume that egg is in most things, even if it's just the glaze on the top and stuff. Um and literally sometimes you'll go places and have to politely say like look is there egg in it and they're like oh we don't know and I'm like well in the politest way I need to know like what foods definitely don't have it in because you could make me really ill and you'll go places and some are really amazing and then you'll go other places that think you're just on a fad diet Mm. or it's like you you vegans and I'm like I'm not vegan like I mean in fairness I'm vegetarian but I love cheese so or like if you go somewhere and I don't know you, you have like a meal that's got cheese on but then you'll go oh I can't eat like egg or whatever they'll look at you as if to go oh you're a f- fussy like vegetarian because you're basically saying oh because a lot of the time I'll probably go more for a vegan option just to be on the safe side while I'm out but then I've also spotted at times you'll go somewhere and there'll be like a vegan burger. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. And it'll say with mayo, which obviously mayo's got egg in. And then you'll say, is this vegan mayo? And they're like, no. So I'm like, so you're basically selling a product that's vegan. That actually isn't the minute you put the sauce on. Unless this vegan person thinks to ask you, they've just basically eaten an egg, which is insulting enough but when you're someone that it's actually going to make you sick um he's quite bad so i've noticed sometimes even vegan food if they put sauce on it's like they don't think that the sauce has to be vegan as well I'm like you could literally just put ketchup on it couldn't you really and sell it with ketchup why are you putting actual mayo on a vegan meal that's bonkers yeah so, yeah it, it, it is crazy all these different like foods for, for different people like you're yeah, vegan vegetarian and normal like i like cheese too like i never used I to <laughs> I, when i was younger i thought oh, all these cheese stink of, of horrible and, but but now I, like i'm more of the taste of it like so i i love like a bit of camembert and 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 the, all these sort of different flavored cheeses and yeah. They are really nice, just like everyone crackers or just eat them normally. But they are lovely, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, that's one thing because I was, um, I was dairy intolerant when I was a kid. I couldn't eat milk. I had to have soy milk, and everyone was going, "Oh, it's going to be milk that's causing your stomach to be bad. It's going to be milk." And I'm like, honestly, I've had. I don't really like milk. I have a little bit in my coffee, but I'm obsessed with cheese. Um, and I'm like, honestly, it, it's definitely not the day. I cut it out for a bit and I, I was, it didn't make a difference, which I'm glad because at least then I can go, actually, it's not dairy. Obviously, I've realised it's egg, but the a little bit of milk I'm fine with. But I find that it's more like richer food. So I love Italian. So if I have really rich Italian sauces, they make me ill. Um, I generally have to make pizza from scratch because that, that's if I buy it from places or have a takeaway it's more likely to make me bad um and then like I say it's usually things like vegetables obviously if they've got skin and stuff like that um sometimes I've like the other day I was lucky at the minute I'm feeling okay I'm actually managed to have a Sunday dinner and I was fighting but whilst I was under investigation for two Christmases in a row I was severely ill Christmas day from 
because you almost have the pressure on Christmas Day that you have to eat the same as everyone else and you almost mm. want to eat the same as everyone else. So Christmas Day I always dread because it's like, oh, I really want to eat the same as everyone else, but my stomach does not want the same thing I do. And almost on the third Christmas, you're almost like days before psyching yourself up ready for, am I going to brave it and eat it? Am I actually going to be good and not eat the foods I shouldn't be eating? Um, so, yeah, so like things like um, broccoli and stuff I love, but it does not love me. So, but I think once you've sort of, half the battle, I think he's actually figuring out what is going to make your symptoms worse and knowing can you eat because sometimes you can eat them and other times you literally can't eat them at all and sometimes it can be down to your symptoms are okay at the minute so you it will allow a bit other times it'll go oh no we can't allow that at all and then there's certain things you just can't eat period because you know full well that it doesn't matter whether you're good or bad it's going to make you ill obviously egg for, for me is one of them so but yeah I think once you know a little bit about what foods you can tolerate makes it a little bit easier to sort of manage your symptoms a little bit as well really yeah i i agree like with broccoli actually um i used to love it as a kid uh, well I... I, 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 but now i don't know it's, it gives me a sicking a, a, a sick feeling like well i i like it but i don't like the stick like you know what's attached to like i'll i'll, I'll have to eat it separately <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that like the, the stick. I have to take it apart because I, I just can't eat it now. I used to. I was alright with it, but 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 now I just eat the bush. Or we say, what we say, they call it the bush. <laughs> 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 yeah, I suppose as well with foods like certain textures and stuff obviously bother certain people, don't it? Really, like I've been places where I've been to restaurants with friends, and I don't know what they're called, but yo sushi in Japanese restaurants have these like chocolate uh they're like balls for dessert and they're squishy and my mate got me to try one and the texture of it just i, I was like i can't i can't even chew this it but it was like literally like eating almost like a foam ball and i was like i'm, I'm literally i'm really sorry but this just feels horrible this, i don't even want to chew it it was disgusting so i do think certain textures of foods is just probably not not the one either really yeah it is. It it's all depends on what I, if you like it or not, and if you can like it, it because it, the thing with is with it like like well one time we could be like, we can't handle it, but then maybe a few years later we can we can try it again and we can see we, yeah. if it if it works or we can have it. Yeah. See, they've told me to keep trying egg and almost do it separate. So just try the yolk and try the white, and just keep trying it. And, you know, when you're almost, like, I think if you know it makes you bad, sometimes you can almost make yourself bad through thinking you're going to be bad. But also, I think if it makes you bad a lot, you almost don't want to try it anymore because you're like, oh, what's the point in trying this in six months, a year's time? Because yeah. the last few years yeah. it's made me ill. Chances are it's always going to make me ill. Uh, I was stupid enough to try and try it on holiday. I went to coffee with two of my best mates. Um last year and I tried the tiniest probably not even a teaspoon's worth of egg just the white tried it because I do actually quite like egg um and that night woke up in the middle of the night and needed to be ill and my friends had been out they'd had a drink they're drunk and you know we just like this is a horrible idea why do you think to try it on a day when they're both drunk one's in the toilet being sick I need to get in the toilet and you're having to frantically go and find another toilet in the hotel and it's like midnight. So, yeah, that was the last time I tried eggs. So I don't think I'll be trying it again for a while. No, maybe in a good few years or something. Because um, yeah. like egg is nice. Like, uh, they're all different types of egg you can have. But mm. it's just... I'm sure there's other things that you can have out there. Yeah, yeah. I, I think for me, I, my brain was thinking, oh, you've been a bit healthy for a while. If there's ever going to be a chance of you being able to eat it, it's now. Because um, my body has allowed things like broccoli and stuff like that lately. But it was like, no, we're definitely not allowing this one. Don't push your luck. So 
I don't I don't think I'll have the courage to try it again for quite some time mm. to be honest. It'll take me five years to build up the courage probably to try it again. <laughs> yeah. So when you tried the egg, it, like how, how did it affect you? So is it almost like you're just been you're being sick shortly after that you've had it? No, so some so usually I get acid reflux, but like severe acid reflux, like um because stupidly when I was going through investigation, I thought one of my safe foods was croissants because like they're dry and bread sort of stuff, and I was like just permanently in a state of acid reflux to the point where I was having to sleep with my bed. I'd put blocks under it to put it on an incline to keep the acid in my stomach. Um, and then obviously once I've come off any form of egg-based product, uh, within about two weeks, I, I was like almost like the acid had pretty much gone unless it was like obviously more of a symptom of the other stuff. Um, so acid reflux is the main part, but also it can set my stomach off. But I find if I was in a flare, it would happen almost instantly that it would set my stomach off. If I'm generally quite healthy, it almost happens later on, like hours and hours later. So I've almost forgot I've even tried it. And then all of a sudden I'm like, it, it yeah, and I have to rush to the toilet. Um, but yeah, in a flare up probably within about 15 minutes of eating it, i like, if I, oh yeah, I'd be on the loo. So really I should have realised sooner, but... <laughs> Yeah. I don't think you always do if you're being bad a lot because it you've got all these different like I don't know sometimes you think oh is it just because the weather's been a lot warmer today oh, I've been quite warm like a few people have messaged me when the sun's out and said has your stomach been worse today and half the time you're like yeah weirdly it has so like on a some of the hot days where it's been like nearly 30 degrees and stuff a load of my friends are messaging me to go is your stomach bad because mine's terrible today there's just a group of us all complaining the heat's making our stomach worse. <laughs> <laughs> it, might, it might be the case because like, it makes you tired, the heat, um, and maybe that affects the way your pain levels are. Yeah. yeah. I have noticed if I'm overtired, I'm more likely to be ill. But when I say overtired, I don't mean a bit tired. But like if I've been doing like six, six seven days a week or like I've had periods of time where... I've not had a day off of three and a half weeks. I know full well if I don't manage my time a bit to allow for some time off somewhere. That's why I think I was at the office a few weeks ago. I hadn't had a rest for like six weeks. And I think it usually the tiredness catches up with you and it makes me ill. So tiredness is definitely something that makes me usually, it's almost like my body's going, well, if you're not going to rest, we're going to make you rest. <laughs> so <laughs> It's like you going and like shut down like it's, it's like it's a robot like our bodies are robots and then it, one minute it's going really tired and then you're awake and then <laughs> there's something yeah like pretty much yeah that's usually it my body's just telling me to I have to rest because otherwise I won't so <laughs> yeah you can have like even little things but like, I, I get quite bad fatigue as well so if I go out for a walk I'll, I'll be I'll be naked even if it's just for an hour and then and then I'll be tired for the rest of the day and then I'll stay up in the night and watch what, what, what films. See, I generally can't get to bed before at least 11 midnight, something like that. And then I struggle to stay asleep. I'm one of them people that wake up and go, oh, you need to remember to do this. And then usually I'll wake up around seven. So if I'm lucky, I do get probably six and a bit hours and I, I'm pretty sure if I remember right they reckon people with chronic illness should go up to like 10 hours a day something like that a little bit more than average so already I tend to not sleep like some nights I'll only do five, like on my office days I'm up at like, like five-ish I'll probably only do like four or five hours worth of sleep so instantly you're already starting a little bit on empty before you even start your day yeah and then yes yeah, so so, so certain times I do think my body's just a machine that will keep going and keep going and obviously it doesn't work like that so I think at times I've probably actually made my stomach and my symptoms worse just on the basis that I don't slow down or when I've been doing clients hair I've chosen not to eat just in case and I've starved myself a lot doing stuff like that over the years and obviously do it as a one-off fine but if you're doing it like five six days a week for years 
obviously you're just neglecting your body at that point. So I do think you have to be careful how you treat your body as well to make sure you're actually looking after your body for it to look after you, really. Yeah, that's the most important thing, just to try and look after it as best as you can. Yeah, and I'm quite guilty for being naughty with that. But I, I am slowly learning. I am slowly getting better. So, but yeah, definitely that is one piece of advice I would give people, really, is just make sure it's all right complaining about your symptoms, but you're actually looking after yourself as well. Yeah. You can't expect your body to work perfectly if you're. Yeah, it is because it is, it is really good advice because um, it is important just to look after it. But there will be times you think, I, I want, I want a tree, I want something that I, I maybe I won't agree oh, with me. <laughs> yeah, I do, I do think at the end of the day, if you stuck with it, part of my French is shitty illness. The least you can do occasionally is have food that I've been like, like I've been on games and I've gone to my friend, oh, my stomach's in agony. And they're like, why? Have you had something nice? I'm like, yeah, potato skins. And then they'll kill themselves laughing, going, that's a treat. And like, well, it is for me. So to say that I don't eat foods occasionally or shouldn't eat, um, but you've almost got a way of, is this food worth the symptoms that are probably going to happen if I eat it? And sometimes I'll be like, Nah. and then other times I'm like oh I'm not in work for a few days so it's with the gods now whatever happens happens and I'll risk eating it so you do have to you you have to live as well because being ill is going to rob a lot from you really it's going to take away some of your social life it takes away your health it takes away financial sort of implications like the cost of your meds you might not be able to work as many hours. You might have had to have time off to have surgeries. So I think the least you can do is when you can live, try and live a little. And if you want to treat yourself occasionally, otherwise you're just being in survival mode. Just It just makes you depressed. Like it's mentally tough as it is without, like I say, permanently keeping yourself in survival mode, really. Yeah. It's very important to try... It's a it's a trump try to do stuff we we want to do, but once we're okay and we we ain't got much pain and we can move out, it, those are the days that we want to try and think about doing stuff. But yeah, definitely have treats like especially if it's birthdays or Christmas. Hopefully, um, <laughs> um, the day are the times that we want to try and treat ourselves or because it's a, it's a celebration kind of time. We probably will have birthdays and special events where we're not doing good at all, but um, hopefully most of them are okay. Yeah, like, and it's just being sensible. Like, I went to a work do recently and it was in Birmingham. And it's, it's almost like by the time I get the train and everything back, it's like a 45 minute journey minimum. So, that is not the time to try out a meal you don't know if you're safe with because trying to get home if you're not going to be well. Whereas on Christmas Day, I'm at my family's house. They already know about all my symptoms. There's a toilet right by me. Like, if I want to let loose because it's Christmas Day. So I think it's like knowing your environment as well. You almost have to analyse and calculate, like, how close am I to get home and stuff like that? Because I've got a phobia of public toilets. So I'll do anything to avoid going to a public toilet. And especially the thought of having a flare or anything and being stuck with a public toilet is like my idea of hell. So you almost calculate, but even despite never wanting to use one, the minute you walk into a pub straight away, you think, well, where's the nearest toilet? So subconsciously, like um, one of my friends has got bladder issues and we always joke about who spots the toilet first because you guarantee if you go out with someone healthy, they'll always go, where's the toilet? And me and her will straight away go, it's over there. And we've already clocked it when we walk in because it's almost like your brain set to emergency mode thinking I need to know where that toilet is just in case I need it. So mo most people with any sort of toilet issues will instantly be the best person to tell you wherever the nearest toilet is, no matter where you are, really. Definitely, definitely. But <laughs> how would you say you're doing at the moment? Like, Do you think you're doing OK? Um, this is the best I've been doing in years at the minute um like I say I had that one day at the office a few weeks ago but other than that I get the odd little bit 
but I think for me personally a lot of it has just come from acceptance so there probably are days where I'm not actually as good but I probably don't think about it it's like when it's all quite new and it's first happening it's it makes you a lot more tense and you don't deal with it well mentally it's it's tough and you're trying to figure out how to deal with it what it even is and then I think as time goes on like now I feel a bit more I feel like you get tunnel vision if you want answers and then I got answers then they got took away from me so now it's just a bit like whatever I have I have I just need to deal with it in the best way possible and I think the minute you get to acceptance it makes everything a lot easier and there probably are days where I go like I know full well I go more than average on a good day like I feel like most of us probably do but even if I went four to I think unless I went up to about six times only then would I start to categorize it as probably a bad well a moderate day anything after six I'll be thinking oh it's not as good today but I feel like when you first start being bad going four to six times you'd think oh like this is really alarming whereas years later you're like I've only been three times today that's an amazing day um but like obviously to someone healthy the amount of times they've said to me oh I've been really ill and like oh like yeah they'll be like oh I think I might have food poison I've been to the few toilet a few times like oh right and then they'll be like I've been four times I'm like mate four times is a healthy day for most of us like what you want about yeah but yeah so I I think yeah like I say things are pretty good right now and yeah starting to accept it and just manage it really yeah that's good that's good like for me it um a healthy day would be two um if I get three or even four I that's not a good day and uh, I start to worry like because I'm not used to that and especially if they're one after the other in a really close amount of time um because my pattern changed once I had grown it was always the evening and now it's always the it would be in the morning now, which I, it, was, it was a bit weird. Like as soon as I get done after Crohn's, <laughs> the whole pattern changes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd say for me, two, two, two to four, anything less, I'd be panicking. I think that's actually the worst way. So when people tell me they're constipated when they've got IBD, it sounds horrific. Like I'd actually almost rather go too much than not enough. So I think any less than two, I'd be panicking, thinking this isn't normal, what's gone wrong. And then I think anything over five, six, I'd start to think, oh, this is not a very good day. And then I think if I ever got into where I was before, where it was like eight to 14, then I'd be thinking, oh, crap, I'm back in rubbish territory again now. So that's that. So I'd probably definitely be on the phone to the IBD team going, please, please can you just investigate me again, just to be sure. <laughs> yes, but that, that is right. But like... um. But it is it is one of those things like um that, 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 that we don't like to do it, but if we have to, we have to. Mm, yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. So do, at the minute, I do you are you on any like certain um me, me, medication or anything like that at, at the moment? No, so I just take the occasional blood meds for, uh, that clot my blood when I need it to. Um, and other than that, at the minute, I'm medication free because with my stomach, they said, unless I was ever severe enough for biologics, they'd never give me any meds. I imagine if I did start to flare, they'd probably consider steroids, but they basically said nothing for that. And at one point, I was on, I was popping acid reflux meds, um, lands off. I can never pronounce any of these names but yeah I was on acid (laughs) I was on I was popping acid reflux meds for for quite some time and it I weaned myself off them because I was like I'm too young to be taking this many and obviously once I found out it was egg um I managed to win so so I do try my best to avoid tablets where possible the only thing other thing is is, um with my ribs I have quite strong painkillers that I can take when it's quite bad because when it it's at its worst it it's like I'd say the pain's pretty horrific to be honest so I do have pain meds for that they offered me stronger and I refused it so it was like I don't want to be a 30 year old on really hardcore painkillers because 
when I get to like 60, if I make it to 80, then I'm going to have nowhere, I'm gonna, not going to have anything I'll be able to take because I'll have already maxed out pain management in my 30s. I'll be used to it. So I do try my best where possible not to take those. Um, but also, I think with pain management as well, if you're someone who's mentally struggling, pain meds can make you numb and you can get addicted to almost the feeling of feeling a bit numb inside because it can be very difficult at times to deal with. People do not give enough credit to how it affects your mental health. And I think painkillers sometimes, like when I would take mine, I'm away with the fairies for a bit. So it's almost like I get a mental shut off with a little bit of pain relief. So I think for me, I'm always a bit conscious that am I taking them because I'm actually in pain or am I trying to mentally just shut off as well as the pain? So um, when people say about, oh, I don't know how people get addicted to painkillers, I'm like, it's very easy to get addicted to painkillers if you let yourself, if you're in enough pain it makes you miserable for a start, let alone the pain you're in, so. Yeah, definitely. Um, with your, um, like, what, I know you haven't, we end, we, I know we spoke about game before, but when you do your yeah. game, and I know you haven't done it for a while, but when, when, when you do do it, do you talk about, like, like, like you're crying, like, 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 like all, yeah. all, 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 all your stuff? Yeah, yeah so, so I had a stream for a little bit, that was called Rolling in the Cronies. So I used to occasionally just chat to people um, who'd got IBD or um, any kind of stomach issue. I think I did the odd few where um, they were not necessarily related to Bell. So I did um, endometriosis and polycystic ovaries. I had a couple of my friends who've got autism come on and chat about what it's like to, to, to have autism and stuff. So I did cover quite a few subjects. Um, and then I also used to do just where it was uh, basically me and my friends or just used to say we're the misfits because we're all a bit broken or crazy or a bit nuts. So uh, I think there's like two that have got autism, two that have got ADHD, no, probably three that have got ADHD. Um, me with like my bells and every other health issue I've got going. So and then we used to just cause carnage on games and stuff. So um hopefully it just give people a bit of a laugh because how I didn't get banned at times with my friends I, I don't know to be honest there's sort of dark humor they'd come out with but any day now I'm getting that ban on Twitch so um yeah so I haven't streamed in about 10 to 12 months because I've just been too busy I would like to start streaming I do miss it um, I don't think I'd probably go back to the Rome and the Cronies just purely because I don't know officially what I've got I'd want to keep it much broader because the one thing I would say about the IBD community is a lot of the time we're quick to judge others for IBS but a lot of people got told they'd got IBS in the beginning and then ended up with IBS and I do think at times we need to be careful that we just don't gaslight people with IBS because actually they might find out they've got IBD so I tend to generalise more stomach stuff really just because I imagine for myself a lot of it probably is IBS but also I don't believe IBS probably put 20 ulcers in my insides either no. so um yeah so yeah. I, I do think it's one of those where I, I, I'm a bit more conscious of I've tried to at times keep it broad and now just because obviously I don't know what I've got I don't want to offend anyone so yeah it is it's better to do that way so kind of saying like you just got your your stomach and me medical issues to kind of <laughs> like, like the eight eight about eight, eight years battle of, of all that yeah. and, and and still kind of unknown of what it's still into the unknown really for you that you you don't actually yeah. know what it is but from what yeah. I, from what i've heard it does like for the, for the different things, it, it does look like it could be IBD. What kind of IBD? Mm -hmm. You don't know, like because they're all yeah. different in their own way. But more so Crohn's, I, I would say. But I'm no specialist. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, yeah. <laughs> I, see I, I, yeah. a, a few of my friends who've got Crohn's because I talked to quite a few people who um, probably found me through my stream actually, which is lovely. I still talk to quite a few people. 
people. So if they do end up watching this, shout out to them because I, I got quite a few loyal people following my streams, which was so nice. And when I've told them stuff like they've revoked it, they're like, well, it's obvious, giving you symptoms, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, yeah, but we're not doctors. So, um, but obviously for me, the location um, is mostly more coming from where my small and my large meet. So when they did the second colonoscopy, which is when they said, oh, we don't think it's Crohn's, a lot of my friends have turned around and gone, yeah, because it's probably all congregated more when you're small. Because um, apparently it's more common to be in your small bowel than your large. I don't know. Um, so, yeah, so most mine congregates between where it meets, really. Um, so, yeah, so it's a hard one. Like, I'll have periods where most of my pain, if I get it, comes off to the right-hand side. Um, and the also is right just to the right of my belly button and probably a little bit lower which obviously is where all that inflammation would sit. So if ever our periods of time where it's really painful there, I just assume that I've got ulcers again because I think ulcers, once you've experienced them, you sort of know when you've got them again because you're almost in pain if you don't eat because you get a buildup of acid. You finally get the bravery to eat and you get relief for about half hour and then your body tries to digest it and then you're back in agony because it feels like sandpaper <laughs> where the food's running over all the sores. Oh, no. So <laughs> so I do think anyone who's experienced ulcers, usually you, you get a specific kind of burning pain from not eating and then a raw pain from it all like food grazing over it, I guess. So, And it always predominantly sits more on the right side and then radiates uh around my side if it gets quite bad or it sits more frontal so for me most of the pain I do get is usually off to that side um and then I don't know if you've experienced this but uh sometimes I'll get almost like air trapped in my intestines and you can almost hear it gurgling and stuff and at times I've been sat and almost it's like wherever it got trapped moves and it's almost like an internal fart noise. Yeah. <laughs> and you'll just be sat and it'll just make these loudest fart noise ever. The people sat next to you like, is this going, what on earth is that? It's like, oh, it's, apparently whatever air trapped just moved. <laughs> it, it's like when you're hungry, um, isn't it? It's, it's, it? it's like when you're hungry and like your stomach's rumbling, like you're hungry, but you're not. Uh, it's, yeah. just, it's, it's just that and then like people will hear it and like i'll have food in front of me well when, when i would hear all this noise um and i was i would eat and i'm bloated before i've been started and i hear all this noise like, i want to yeah. eat it i'm so bad i want to eat the food in front of me yeah, um yeah. but i can't I, I i can't and it's annoying because i'll say to my mum, I, I can't eat anymore i'm full and they'll say you haven't even started i know but i'm in too much pain i can't yeah. have it and yeah, yeah. I need like baby food and, and all, all stuff like that to. Yeah, yeah. Or I start to just like the meal, like I'm fine, I'm hungry, and the meal's in front of me, and then all of a sudden I just randomly feel like really sick or something. Uh, but yeah, so I've noticed with the with your intestines, if you're getting like into like not even, it sort of like feels like rumbling, but like you say, it's not not actually hunger rumbling. It's just like weird rumbling. And then I don't get it very often, but it does actually feel like, you know, when a balloon gets deflated and it goes right, <laughs> it's almost like it feels like that and it sounds like that, but you don't actually fart or anything. And the only people I've ever found who experience that are usually people with IBD. No one else knows what you're on about when you say, oh, did you ever get that sensation and hear the noises? Um and then the other one that I get that's quite an embarrassing one, thankfully I don't get it very often because the one thing with me is they've said that you, um, with Crohn's, obviously most people do get blood and things like that. And I've, other than on two occasions where I had barely any, so I don't know if it was just without being vulgar, probably just piles or anything really, I don't know. Um, I've never really ever had blood, which obviously is quite a, a standard one for Crohn's um however I've had periods of time where um it's quite quite embarrassing and it's only through talking to other people with Crohn's like on the quiet that you realize it's it's okay because 
that not that they're getting it and you should be relieved but almost like it's normal to someone i guess um so i could have gone to the toilet in the morning a few times to totally feel fine or whatever um go and have a shower get out of the shower this is like hours later so i haven't been to the toilet for hours go for a shower wash myself obviously clean myself properly get out of the shower or I usually put on like a toweling dressing gown put on this toweling dressing gown go and sit on my bed and let myself dry off half the time because I can't be asked to like whatever sit there forget I exist for a good five ten minutes get up um go to put my clothes on and I'll notice I've got like um a slightly yellow patch on my dressing gown for obviously from my, my but I assume that is like leaking bile um but I felt totally fine I've not been to the toilet for I've clearly washed so it's got to be and you can't feel it happening or anything like that and obviously that's quite a big one if you're a young person because you're like how is this happening I'm like 30 um and I don't think that's a stereotypical symptom that you would get in something like like I don't know any friends who have IBS unless they're just not being honest that suffer with that but I know plenty of people with IBD who get that mm. um so there is a few obviously symptoms that would probably horrify normal healthy people or whatever but um yeah so that one whilst it hasn't happened to me for a period of like quite a long period of time it has happened consistent quite a lot um so yeah so then obviously it's quite embarrassing because then you're paranoid about it happening and stuff like that so I think whatever I do have, I don't think you can easily dismiss it as just a bit of IBS because I'm still getting embarrassing symptoms and stuff like not that not that you wouldn't get embarrassing symptoms obviously with IBS, but like symptoms that are a bit more complicated, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. It, IBS is a like a lot of people do get said like uh, like with IBD, you, you, it might be IBS. Um and I remember at college once, uh, like uh, a long while ago, um, like they was making this milkshake and they said, um, they, 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 you've got IBS, haven't you, Mason? This will help at your Crohn's. And I said, yeah, you you got it right. I've got Crohn's, but IBS, I haven't got IBS. And and a milkshake might be what at that certain time probably one of the worst things to have. Um, but now and then I have one now. Um, if I'm doing okay. Um, but yeah. It is, it's a, it, is, it is annoying, but it's not kind of saying IBS is like it's not saying that IBD is worse than IBS, but really the two terms are really that IBS is more of a um, you, you find that you don't have surgery or you don't have any, it's quite rare. Not to say that you that, that's not impossible that you, you might have it depending on how bad it is, but normally it can be a diet kind of thing. I think IBS where it can be helped. With a diet thing with Crohn's, there are similar things between the two, but with Crohn's, yeah. it's a bit more complicated than IBS. But it is annoying if people are put in that boat saying that I be you got IBS, and uh, it's, yeah. probably, it's probably more known actually. People probably more know about IBS than IBD. I think most people, unless they've had IBD, probably don't know that the, like they've got IBD. They don't know the difference between what the initials stand for or anything like that um obviously I do think I have IBS with something because obviously when I'm tired and stuff I think that could actually be more of an IBS thing and same with the egg it's probably more of an IBS thing so I do think there's probably elements of it there but I think there's probably something a little bit more under the surface as well whether that's obviously IBD or bacteria overgrowth is, is obviously something else um, and obviously with ulcers, I think maybe to have like one, maybe you'd think, or maybe it is a severe case of IBS, but to have quite a few more, I think, like I said, and then I think having bell leaks and stuff like that, whilst only small, I don't think is a stereotypical trait of an IBS. It usually happens in more complicated situations, yeah. really. Um and like I say, with that, I'm not even aware it's happening. I don't even know, like, um, what's probably triggered it and stuff like that. Um, or, to be fair, sometimes I'll, I've been where I almost know I need to 
<laughs> without being vulgar, I need to pass wind. I know I don't need to go to the toilet. I just need to pass wind. However, it's almost like you know for well you don't trust it either. And I'll go to the toilet, and sometimes I've almost gone to the toilet and just passed by. Or I've not actually passed like proper like you know poo or whatever it's just literally boil so like there's certain things like that whilst I don't have blood I get boil quite a lot um and it's like how do you explain that to someone healthy and so it's obviously gets quite embarrassing at times like my best mates are sound and stuff like that they're just all oh, Sam needs to go home to go to the toilet and stuff but when you meet new people trying to be like yeah, I don't know. I don't think people always obviously understand all that. They just think it's a bit of belly ache and going to the toilet. They don't realise that you might actually be a young person who has leaks. And, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. all the it, symptoms you probably associate with an elderly person or whatever. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I think blood is a very complicated thing as well because um, blood can be so many different things, not, not just IBD. Um, but mm. it's like, I will get blood, um, like both I, I i'm quite prone to get a nosebleed because i went on a skydive last year um and I, like a couple of days before i was having a blow nosebleed after nosebleed after nosebleed uh, and i was, I was mm. thinking am i gonna do it I, I don't want to go down and have a nosebleed um but i, I was fine in the end but i'm up the um going to the toilet and having blood that is a normal thing for me um but um, <laughs> it's, it's more because of the inflammation um and stuff like mm. that um today I actually had some but um it's one of those things that happens like I can have I go a good load of days not having any and then it's back again but it's one of those things that is a IBD thing and then um but it's we get used to these things don't we that that happen and we we have to try and deal with them yeah I I think for me personally like day to day I don't you don't probably think about it anymore because you, you get so used to it happening and it's only really around new people or like say for instance if I was to date someone or something it's one of those like I'm paranoid about how they're how they'd see it because it's like geez this woman spends a lot of time in the toilet and do you know what I mean like there's certain <laughs> things where you just feel oh it's just easier to be on your own so that people don't have to see that like not see it but almost see you keep going to the toilet and yeah so like whilst it, it's it, you get used to it yourself I think it can so yeah it's 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 one of those things who knows you might have a date on the toilet or something like that have, have, have the meal in front of you. <laughs> uh, if, if, if worst case scenario but these kind of things that if, are like like you find out who your true friends are find out who if they like you properly um yeah the way you right. are because it is hard to say this kind of stuff up front um yeah. really like to, to people and it's hard but uh, if we try and be honest to them and they, they can decide if they want to do that or not i think yeah definitely i agree definitely but um last thing sam before we finish um yep. um i know you said some like advice earlier but is there any anything else that you want to say like any more advice or just any last what thoughts um i think for anyone who's new and going through diagnosis or potential diagnosis i think mentally just make sure you try and keep yourself as strong as possible because there's going to be times where it really will impact you and you do almost get into a pit of depression and stuff like that trying to search for answers um so please please don't be alone in it go out and speak to other people in the community I have had far better advice off people in the community than I have off doctors a lot of the time nothing personal to doctors but I trust people who've got an illness more who are living with it day to day, who can give you great advice on how they manage their pain, like hot water bottles, for instance, are amazing. So um, definitely, definitely go and speak to people in the community, even if you think, oh, I don't know if I have it, go and speak to people who do. Lots of people will be welcoming. Um, and really think about your mental health. Like if you're struggling, I think the best thing to do is actually talk to people who are like-minded, who understand these symptoms um and also there is light at the end of the tunnel so whilst yeah fair enough I still think having a good day is going to the toilet up to up to four times I'm not going 14 at the minute whether that lasts is something else but you will have times that 
you don't you don't feel like it's ever going to get better but it does and you you do have light at the end of the tunnel so just please please like if you're going through a period of time where it doesn't feel like it's going to get better i had at one point probably five six years of feeling like one thing after another it's never getting better and it has so please please it might not happen in a day or a week even a year but it will happen so yeah yeah I think that's probably the best advice I can try and give, really. <laughs> Definitely, very good advice. And, yeah, fingers crossed you don't go 14 times a day. But, uh... <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I hope you've enjoyed it, Sam, co coming on. Um, Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it as yeah. well. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, well, we got there in the end, I think, after several months, um, I think. Um, I think it, 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 that's the battle of, of, like, the the journey of, like, all these kind of things. Because we we we're always busy and we always teams to do stuff, so it's a good job we uh we got here and we and we done it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, yeah, it's hard, mostly my fault. Just no. keeping myself busy all the time and just think that oh, I don't know. I am literally a robot going through the motions. Yeah, yeah. But... <laughs> it's a good way to be though. It's a, it's a good way to be busy because and then you won't get bored. Well, you might get bored of being too busy, but you know. <laughs> I, ironically, I am um, all my friends joking with me saying about they think I might be autistic. I went to the doctors the other day and they actually have sent off an ADHD form instead. Oh. And on one of the other questions was, do you always feel the need to keep busy and you can't sit still and stuff like that? And I was like, yeah. So ironically, <laughs> so I was not expecting that. So it does make sense. But yeah, I think keeping busy as well it takes your mind off symptoms. And, stuff. and I think when you get to a point where you're actually feeling quite good, it's almost like, right, I now need to cram everything into such yeah. a tiny space while I feel good. But yeah, so I do have the need to be like permanently busy. So. <laughs> Yeah, you have to let me know because I know those sort of things take time, but you have to let me know what like results are and everything because I know yeah. I, I've, I've got autism, I'm autistic and got Crohn's and I know about maybe three other people that have it. So it's really rare. It's really yeah. rare to have people with autism and, and Crohn's or eventually. Okay. So if you end up having that, you have to let me know. <laughs> I mean, as far as I'm aware at the minute, I don't think this, I need to ring them actually. They need to... Uh, I need to find out if they're actually sending my autism one off, but I know full well they've definitely sent the ADHD one off. And I said to them, I don't think I need to fill this form in, but I'll do it anyway. And ironically, that's the one that's come back. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people do have ADHD tend to have autism too. Um, yeah. It's quite, it's quite, I know some people that have one or the other, but it's more, autism is more commoner, if that's a word. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, and then you have ADHD, but um there's always a stigma around everything whatever we have there's always going to be a stigma to kind of yeah, break yeah. it but yeah, yeah. you have to let me know but um yeah. i'm glad you've enjoyed it and coming on um no, i appreciate it thank you for your time yeah. and uh, inviting yeah. me on it's been nice yeah it, it's been really nice and on here we do i have i do autism episodes as well so if you do eventually have like, oh, AJC or autism, <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah. if you end no, up having it again you'll have to come on and we'll talk about that maybe next time okay. i mean i can recruit in some friends you can have like a, literally a whole about four of us lined up with adhd and autism yeah. between us that just cause can probably end up getting you blooming banned off soon yeah. anyway, we'll <laughs> so you know thank you yeah, thank you thank you um to anyone that's name watching today we hope you've enjoyed it um on this really cool episode talking about loads of different stuff i can't say we talked about one thing in particular but it's been it's been really fun thanks to sam and we'll see you in the next episode whenever that is <laughs>